Hello and welcome to the John Ark Show. Back in the day, millions of kids around the world grew up wanting to become rock stars. Today, we're going to interview someone who actually did it. We're going to interview Prince's legendary keyboard player, Matthew Fink, aka Dr. Fink. He is best known for playing the keyboard in Prince's band called The Revolution. He often wore that, uh, that doctor's uniform. He also worked with artists, songwriters, and producers like The Time, Vanity Six, P. Diddy, and many, many others. Fink has won three Grammy Awards, three American Music Awards, and numerous RIAA Gold and Platinum Awards for his work. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel for free. You can also like, comment, and follow us. We're going to have a lot of great celebrity interviews coming up, so make sure to click on that notification bell so you can be notified every time we uh, upload a new episode. Also, we ask that you post a link to today's show on all your social media to help spread the word. Now, let's say hello to Matthew Fink. Hello, Matt. Welcome to the John Ark Show. How are you today, sir? I'm, I'm doing quite well, thanks. Okay. How about you? Doing really well. Matt you, Matt, you and Prince and your band, The Revolution, created an explosion of great music that people still enjoy to this very day. How old were you when you first started playing the keyboards? I think I was around uh, five and a half, six, right in there. Mm -hmm. Now, we've had Prince's sound engineer, Susan Rogers, on the John Ark Show, and she told us that uh, when she first met Prince, uh, she told us the entire story, actually. Tell us about how you first met Prince and how your paths crossed with him, and, and how did you become a part of his band? Okay. Uh, I met him at, at my audition for the band, actually. I'd never met him before that. And the only way that I was acquainted with him at that point was hearing his first album, which had been released by then on Warner Brothers, and also through uh, a friend of mine by the name of Bobby Rivkin, who, a.k.a. Bobby Z, the drummer who was in the first group uh, with Prince and myself in the Revolution. And uh, I knew him because uh, we grew up in the same community. So he actually uh, introduced me to Prince, uh, introduced me to his music when his older brother was working on demos for Prince, his, his brother David, who was uh, producing music at that time as well. So uh basically bobby played me prince's demos i said they sounded amazing uh what's he gonna do with this and at that time they hadn't uh sent any of it out to record labels so he didn't have a record deal that was about a year before he uh got so uh, about seven months before he was signed but he did get a record deal and and after that happened i you know contacted bobby again and i just said is he putting a band together at some point and he goes yeah and i said well let me know when you start looking because I'd, I'd like to meet him and hopefully audition for the group. And he said, okay, I'll see if I can make that work. But uh, there, there were a lot of people they were looking at and it took me a while to get my foot in the door, you know, to get an audition, but eventually I did. And that was in the uh, fall, like October of uh, 78. And uh, that's when I first met Prince. Now Prince had not recorded any albums prior to that, had he? He had not, and the, that was only his first album on Warner Brothers. He had he had played on a couple things for people, you know, like session work and studios and jingles and things like that, but he hadn't put out a solo effort yet up to that point. Now, what was the first album that you and Prince recorded together and released? Uh, that would be probably the third album, Dirty Mind. Okay. What yeah. was your social life like before you joined the band? And how did becoming uh, Prince's keyboard player change your social life? Did it make it easier to meet women and celebrities? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, that, that was a, a, could be a perk. You know, <laughs> as things uh, ramped up in popularity, the, the, those things became more and more prevalent, yes. Now, what were some of the monster hits uh, that you played on with Prince? Uh, well, for sure, you know, the songs on Purple Rain, uh, most of those songs and uh, a few things on 1999, uh, Controversy, you know, everything from Dirty Mind on till when I left, uh, which was the gra Graffiti Bridge album, I, I had some sort of session work on those or 
small co-writes on a few songs here and there, you know. Now, we've heard from other musicians, like Morris Day, for example, that Prince was really tight with his money. Do you think that most of the other musicians in the revolution who managed their money well got rich while playing in the band, or do you doubt that? You know, I really don't know. I'm not really privy to uh, other people's finances, but uh, um, I, I always felt that Prince was fair to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not sure about other people. I know that some people felt that uh, maybe he wasn't as fair, um, but uh, I never really had a problem with him from a business standpoint. Tell me about the writing process. Generally, how long did it take Prince to write, record, produce and release his hits? Well, it depends on the album and the song. You know, it's it's a song to song, song by song basis, really. Um, you know, I, I, I saw him linger over some tracks. I noticed he would have his lyrics out there in a booklet and he'd be working on them and I could see the title and then I'd see that again a few weeks later. So sometimes songs would sit around for a while on the shelf or he'd get a start on it and he'd move on to something else and then he'd come back to it when he was inspired. So it really varied, uh, I believe. But I really, you know, I really didn't witness a whole lot of his writing process except for what he did in front of the band, uh, which wasn't a ton, really, in that respect. I mean... He usually had things worked out pretty well when he brought albums to us, unless he really requested our presence in the studio to do the live playing on those, you know, but, but for, for like Purple Rain, for instance, um, I had a, like a small co-write on the song Computer Blue, and that song was kind of inspired by me jamming at a sound check one day with the band. I started playing a groove on the left hand. It was like a bass part that kind of drove the song. And he said, oh, I really like that. And he started building a groove around that. Then he took Wendy and Lisa in the studio and worked with them. He gave them some writing credit on what they did. And then Prince's father uh, had a melody section that Prince really liked from a past musical piano piece his father had written. And he used that for the bridge of the song, the instrumental bridge of Computer Blue. So that was one instance where he, he had five or four collaborators with him, and uh, including his father. That was kind of rare, though. So, so that was that was one of those songs. But like a song like Seventeen Days, he he credited the Revolution on that entire song. Each band member, the song America, same thing. He he credited us uh, on that, and then he gave us some artist royalty points for the whole album of Purple Rain just because of our contributions as session players on that record. So, and, and the parts that we, we wrote for those songs, even though he was the main, the only lyricist and writer of those melodies. So, you know, usually uh, melody and lyrics constitute the whole song. Arrangement, you know, if you're a session player and the song's already written, you're just coming in there and you're, you're getting paid a side fee to play on it, something for somebody like Prince usually. But, um, you know, he tended to, to treat us fairly though and, and pay, you know, I never had a complaint about the pay really. I, Where was I, the I, real I, money uh, generated? Was it the royalty payments? to? Yeah. The, oh, sure. Or was you're, it your whole writing credit? Well, you're always best to, to have publishing and writing if you can get it okay. with, with any, anybody in any capacity in the music industry, you know? Um, and, there's also other revenue from from things like sync licensing which means synchronization rights to use a song in a film or a tv show or a video game you know and, and that's another kind of income in the music industry these days or has been going on for years but it's a it's a good way to make extra money these days because of these the, the streaming platforms uh, don't really you know com musicians don't like how they pay so um you know, there's other and touring, of course, the the live performance and and then merchandise on the side will uh, help artists these days. But so, back in the day, you know, when you had a major label deal like Prince had, uh, there was a lot more support for someone like him. So without label. revealing any uh, finances that are too personal, without revealing the actual numbers, give us a sense for the mathematics. If you have a major hit like the song "Purple Rain." and you have a royalty payments is that money that you can retire on over the years or is it not that significant it depends on who you, what you've done 
it's it's all relative to the, the amount of songs you've written, how they still sell into the future. It, it really varies from one artist to the other, you know. Okay. But I do know that when streaming came in, a lot of the really major label, big name artists out there complained about it because they felt like their their royalties changed drastically after that in the negative side. <laughs> Things and, didn't go as well. And I have but heard that the Funk Brothers, who played for Motown, and, mm -hmm. and I have heard that you know a lot of those guys didn't make a lot of money at all, even though they appeared on hit after hit after hit. So, you know, I guess it depends on the arrangement and the... Uh, were they were they writing or were they just being session players? That I can't tell you. But you say that's a okay. significant different difference? It's a different thing. Because yeah. if, if the artist comes in and the producer comes to you and says, hey, I need you to play keyboards on this song, they just pay you a session fee at that point out of their album budget. Whereas if you're actually coming to the artist with the song you wrote and the producer's there... Uh, and the artist, then it becomes you know a little more of a collaboration. But usually, the it's the the songwriter that makes all the royalties. Well, could you tell uh, the songs while you were working on them whether or not they were hits as you heard them in the studio, or does it not work that way? No, I couldn't always <laughs> tell because because when Prince presented me certain songs, I, I knew right away it was going to be a hit, and other ones that I wasn't sure about became hits too. So it, it's subjective and it's always um, depending on what's going to, you know, hit a nerve with your, your audience. You know, there's this great segment uh, on this documentary about uh, Motown and the Funk Brothers where <laughs> Barry Gordy and his staff, they're all sitting in this room and they'll play a song, a song like My Girl, for example, and mm -hmm. then he'll then he'll go from person to person in the room and he'll ask the person do you think that's a hit and the first person would say you know i'm not really sure it doesn't really do much for me and the second person would say it's fantastic it's amazing how different people can interpret different music differently it is i mean my it's girl it's true my girl yeah. is such an obvious masterpiece to me but yet mm -hmm. at that time you know it didn't strike some people that way so you know Perception is a very, very interesting thing. Well, yeah, but I'd like I'd like to just uh, digress slightly about the Beatles because yeah. when when they hit, obviously, uh, they struck such a massive cultural nerve that they were they were one of those exceptional uh, acts that came out and changed culture, you know, completely around. And Prince did that too in a lot of respects in his own way, but. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, you can't, I will say one thing about myself as a listener, though. I, I've been the, the judge on songwriting contests and panels about judging songs and stuff. And uh, more than once, I've always picked the one song that would win in the end. I was one of the people. So I think I have a good ear for hits. But nobody's 100% accurate, but I think I, I would make a great A&R guy someday if anybody wanted to bring me on board to work for a label. Yeah, absolutely. Now, who were some of the women that Prince was dating while you guys were all in the band? Who were some of the women Prince was dating? Yes. Boy, that's a, that's a tough one because... Uh, uh, I know he was engaged to Wendy's sister at one point, so he almost married her. Um, I don't know what happened with that, but uh, they broke up, and uh, he was dating you know a few other people before her that I knew. When I first joined the band, he had this high school sweetheart still that he was dating at that time, and she even she was even in Purple Rain in the movie as an extra. You know, they remained friends really for quite some time, even after they weren't uh, an item. Uh, but he, he must have been very special. She must have been special to him, I mean. and uh, But uh, I don't know. I mean, he, he dated a lot of women. I couldn't keep track of them all, really. I didn't try to, anyway. You know, And, of course, we know he, he got married twice. You know, uh, I have heard that Prince uh, was completely crazy about vanity, whether that's true or not. Yeah, not. yeah, he was. Yeah, they, they, he really loved her. He really did. I truly believe he, he was in love with her. And when she turned down the, the role in Purple Rain, I was, uh, and both of us were disappointed. I, I was pretty good friends with Vanity, actually, mm. you know. 
So we stayed in touch over the years after I was out of the group and, and she had moved on to doing other things. What effect did his relationships have on his work? Did his girlfriends act as his muse? You know, some did, possibly. Uh, I do know that uh, Susanna Malvoin, who he almost, like I said, they were engaged, she, she influenced him for sure, especially with the songs uh, Starfish and Coffee, which she co-wrote, you know, the lyrics for do you that think, song. Do you think that Vanity was the love of Prince's life, or was he just hypnotized by her looks? You know, that's a tough one. I have no idea. Uh, I think she could have been, possibly, if he'd allowed it. That's all I'm saying. I don't think he was ready to let that kind of thing in his life yet. But she definitely could have been somebody uh, that would have been a powerful partner for him, I think. What was the work schedule like when you guys were all working with Prince? Did he give you weekends off, or was it just work, work, grind, grind, nonstop? It really depended. You know, I mean... Getting ready for tours, obviously, was a grind. Not a grind, I just say it was hard. I loved the work, don't get me wrong. It wasn't a grind, it was just, it was a, a long hours, let's put it that way, getting ready for tours. And uh, But but when the tours were done, we usually had a nice break, you know. I mean, sometimes I'd get a month or two away from things where we weren't even doing anything together. We'd all just go our separate ways and work on other projects and, write songs, do whatever we wanted to do. He just let us take breaks like that. So it was it was nice. It was very flexible in that respect. But yeah, well, getting ready for tours. Well, just to give you an example, we I'd show up at 10 in the morning. He'd show up at noon. I'd go over things a couple hours before he'd get there. Other band members would sometimes be there early with me. Not always. And then we'd go till anywhere between 6 and 8 that evening rehearsing. And then he'd go in the studio all night. And then he'd be up the next day by about six, seven, eight in the morning and start over again. He, and then he, he was really living on fumes a lot of times, really getting ready for tours. He, he was writing music and, uh, and then he'd get four hours of sleep, maybe five. And then that would be his, the day would be the rehearsal recording, then start over the same thing and maybe get one day off a week, probably take Sunday off, you know. Where do you think the, the people in the band actually made more money was it going on tour or was it participating in the royalties and uh i would say that the, the road stuff for the band because we we didn't write as much with him you know we we weren't able to because uh, he, he had his vision and he wrote the majority of the material but um so yes the tours were were a better money making opportunity than than the royalties were although i will say that what we did when we did have you know the Purple Rain era was was very lucrative for everybody. No, regardless. <laughs> Speaking of, of the Purple Rain era, did you guys have to walk around with cans of groupie repellent everywhere you went? A little bit, a little bit. I didn't really have a problem when I was incognito as not dressed as Doctor Fink. You know, if I wasn't in my stage outfit, I could uh, and if I I could get by not being recognized much but uh, the problem is my hair had, was dyed purple kind of kind of reddish purple kind of and I, I i looked i stood out anyway so i got i got recognized but you know in minneapolis it wasn't too bad you know i could be home and people wouldn't bug me very much did, did members of the band get paid well by the studio for doing the movie um you know, I don't know what constitute well is, what that means to be paid well. I don't know because we we had such minor kind of non-speaking role. I had like one line in the movie, so I thought what they paid was fair, relative to what though, because I'd never been in a film before, so I don't know, you know, if I was being treated fairly or not. I think we were. I think we were though. Now, when things were red hot, did other record companies approach you about starting your own band at that point? No. So after all of the success, I know Prince made many millions of dollars, and he also legally controlled the other bands he had created. Do you think any of the other band members made very serious money, or were they basically just uh, on the payroll making a weekly check? What would you suspect if you had to guess? Just being on payroll. Okay. For sure, yeah. Now, when, when the... When the band and the music was hitting on all cylinders, when the movie was coming out, did you have any old girlfriends or women coming back out of your past wanting to reignite their former relationship with you? No. That's interesting. That's interesting. No. I just, uh, I had I had a few 
I had one girlfriend at that time. And that was it. All right. So what is your perception of the music business today? Is there anything you like about it or don't like about the direction it's going in? Well, I haven't liked the direction of the music industry ever since um, Napster reared its ugly head in the year, I think it was 1999 or 2000, when, when they started uh, pirating uh, music from the major labels and all the you know, independent labels, wherever they were, they were stealing basically and allowing people to get free MP3 downloads at that point. So this, this decimated the music industry in those years in the early twos. I spoke to record label executives out in Los Angeles about it at the time, and they were freaking out and laying people off. And uh, it just really uh, was a difficult time. Uh, it didn't, totally recover really in my opinion 100 percent, but it, but it's doing okay again i think they're doing well the labels um but i just i don't know I, i'd have to really research it some more these days to know what truly is going on because i, I you know i've i've tried looking at the streaming business and, and the model for it and to see you know try to find fairness in it for the artist and um I'm just not sure if it is still, you know, they've been trying to get the rates higher that they pay the percentage rates to streaming. They've, they've improved it a bit. I believe uh, the U S government has helped somewhat with that. Uh, but most musicians and artists still feel like it's not as fair. And they're they're They really are making more money from touring merchandising side hustles like you know a, a product line that they sell on the side like a liquor or vodka or you know the, i'm talking about the really successful artists you know the people that are multi-platinum selling status you know so uh, but they have to do side hustles you know to make extra income i guess i will you say know. this i do think the whole napster phenomena made it easier for spotify and some of the other streaming apps to pay musicians so much less years later i think that's yeah napster that, yeah i was i i meant to spotlight that as well i agree with you 100 percent. that was part of the problem too is that it did make them easier uh, make it easier for them to take advantage of things i believe now back in the day a lot of dance clubs were constantly playing print songs and they would always fill the dance floor with people now we're and this really disturbs me to be honest with you now we're hearing that dance clubs are dead or dying and that people don't even dance very much at the clubs and i think that's a little sad what do you think wow um i had not heard this but then again i'm i'm don't go out to dance clubs much either anymore but not that i wouldn't enjoy it i just uh you know i'm older i i really enjoy edm music though mm -hmm. and and e I, I think uh edm festivals are really interesting and i do enjoy some of the the music coming out of those things the artists doing that style of music but then again there's nothing like a great singer songwriter piece of work either you know i i, I have very eclectic tastes but yeah um i i don't know it's i i, I don't I, that bothers me to hear that that clubs are having issues i didn't realize that maybe COVID had something to do with that or the decline mm -hmm. of dance clubs perhaps i i don't know this is the first i've heard of this from anyone saying that you know what they do you know, you know what they do at the clubs these days they stand what? around and they look at their phones back in the day if you saw a pretty girl at a club what did you do you walked up to her and you started talking asked her to dance now everybody's staring at their phones and in a lot of instances, if you ask a girl to dance, she thinks you're a creep. It, 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 either she thinks you're too forward or there's something else going on. The whole asking a girl to dance at a club phenomena is slowly fading away. It's a, they're all obsessed with taking photographs of themselves on their phones. It's amazing. Wow, wow. I, that's not I, good. That's not healthy. That's no. not healthy. I didn't realize that. Well, you know what? I, I'm going to have to go out and observe this sometime and see if see that's if really true, going on. Yeah, yeah I, which I believe it probably is. And, and But you know what could remedy this if you really were bold? You you could, like, you know, write a text on your phone and then walk up to the girl and turn it to her and say, would you like to dance? And then you hold the phone up to them. <laughs> they might respond better because they're used to responding to texts. Okay? That's that's All the right. solution right there. That's the There solution. it is. Turn the, turn <laughs> the tide.
exactly. Now, is there anything that you would have liked to have done during the height of the band of your band's fame uh, that you were not able to do? Um. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the Purple Rain tour itself, I felt was cut short by Prince. Uh, you know, we we toured the U.S. for a little over six months, and and right towards the end of the U.S. tour, he told us that he didn't want to continue touring into Europe uh, or Australia or Japan, which offers on the table were there at that time, and we all questioned it and said, "Well, what, why don't you want to?" continue and you know bring this to other parts of the world and he, he really didn't give us a firm answer not really he just said I, I i just don't feel like it basically is what he said I, I just not and really unbeknownst to us uh he had been working on well i knew he'd been working on the next album which was around the world today but I, what he said to us at the meeting was not necessarily true and which was uh okay after this leg of the tour of the u.s tour we're going to take a break for two years wow. up to two up to two years i'm taking a break you'll be on retainer meaning i plan to pay you while in this two-year period and and you all as members of the group can pursue whatever you'd like to do in that time frame you can do a solo album if you want you can not do a solo album and just hang around and do nothing and take, you know, or become produce other artists or not do anything, <laughs> go play golf. <laughs> I don't know. You know, he just gave us all these options, like do whatever you want. Take a break if you need to take a break. We're not going on the road. Uh, maybe you'll work on some songs I, with me. I don't know. There was all the, this thing happening and, and, and I was in shock. I said, really, you, you don't want think we should finish in Europe and bring this tour to Europe at least? You know, and he just he just said no. So that I is... was I was I I was highly disappointed. Number one by yeah. that. Number two, the break, the two year break that he said we were going to take, ended after three months. Oh wow! And next thing you know, we're getting ready to do more shows, and we're doing around the world in a day, and learning that album. Well, that... Wendy and Lisa, Wendy and Lisa worked on that album quite a bit with him. That I was not much involved with that one. But uh, we did. We actually we eventually played that material on what was the parade tour, which uh, came out in the fall of '86. Yeah. First of all, I have to say that is an extremely generous and reasonable offer for him to make to somebody. I've never heard of other acts saying, "You know, take a two-year vacation and it's on me." That's but he didn't. Incredible. But he didn't keep his word, though. That's the problem. Yeah. He didn't keep his yeah. word. You know yeah. that that's the issue with with it. So I. Uh, and and you know what? I didn't want to take a two year break personally. I wanted to I wanted to keep going anyway. I mean, I wanted to keep moving on with other things. So I thought, okay, two year break. All right, I'll do a Doctor Fink album. That's what I thought in my head. I'm not going to sit around and just you know <laughs> be lazy. At that time, I was already writing with another songwriting partner. Anyway, I, I was writing songs, uh, and some uh, two of those songs actually, no, one of them for sure got placed in a movie last year. And that that had been sitting on the shelf for all these years, and I shopped it out to some for some sync licensing work after not doing anything. That's anyway, amazing. go ahead. Yeah, amazing. Did you were you guys purely analog up until the very end, or did you start to use digital equipment and digital recording methods? No, by the time I left the group, uh, Pro Tools had just barely started and it was only a, a, a stereo editing program at that time and the most you could maybe get out of it was four tracks and uh so so at that time no prince wasn't using pro tools yet i wasn't everything was still analog um and not long after that that's when pro tools you know by 1995 it started to get to be you know you could have a lot of tracks more tracks to do compete with analog recording now, when you guys went on that big Purple Rain uh, nationwide tour, do you remember approximately how many dates you played and what the ticket prices were like? Was it a monster tour? Yeah, it was, but I can't remember how many. I'd have to refer to the Internet for that answer right now. Right. <laughs> Sorry, it's been too long. Well, Matt, it has been great having you on the John Ark Show. Uh, before we mm. wrap things up, is there anything you would like to promote? Yeah, there's several things I'd like to promote, actually. Please do. Uh, yeah, first of which is uh, 
my son Max, who is a producer out in Los Angeles, um, and he's also an artist in his own right, and he has a stage name that is spelled M-V-X-M-I-L-L-I. His SoundCloud channel is Max Millie. That's how it's you know, how you pronounce his name, but it's spelled M-V-X-M-I-L-L-I. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's uh, currently working with a, a really great songwriting team that's uh, that had placed some songs with the likes of Post Malone and some other uh, big name artists. And he's he's been working with them for the last several months and part of their team now. And uh, it's, But he does have some solo material out there. And then I also work for a couple of really great... Uh, nonprofit music organizations that work with young kids to you know teach them about music and one of them is called future youth records based out in uh, california uh, in cal in uh, san francisco and the other one here which is a fairly new one called unlocked mission based here in minneapolis and uh, we work with kids and we teach them about music and uh it's really fun go in the studio with them and work you know work on songs with them and it, have them write songs and we, you know, bring their creativity out. Do you have a, a website uh, that you can call attention to if anybody wants to reach out for business purposes? Uh, yeah. You know, my personal Dr. Fink website, the Dr. Fink.com is under construction. Well, it's getting modified right now, but it, it'll be up and running probably in a few weeks, but, but that's the Dr. Fink.com. There's no period after DR. And then my Instagram uh, at Matt Fink one, you can reach me there. You can reach me on Facebook messenger. You can reach me at, uh, D R dot F I N K one nine eight one at gmail.com as well. And, uh, so if you, if anybody wants to look at future youth records, that's like future youth records.org and unlock mission, uh, dot org, I believe is the website for the other, uh, and the, the, the one unique thing about Unlock Mission is that it has a 70-foot uh, houseboat with a recording studio built into it. And it's going to be traveling up and down the Mississippi River. We've already done shows along the Mississippi as well last summer. Well, thank you for coming on the John Arc Show. And I want to wish you and your family all the best. You're always welcome back on the show, my friend. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, we hope you enjoyed that episode. I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel for free. You can also like, comment, and follow us. We're going to have a lot of great celebrity interviews coming up. So make sure to click on that notification bell so you can be notified every time we upload a new show. Also, we ask that you post a link to today's show on all your social media to help spread the word. Thank you, and we shall talk to you soon. Bye-bye.